Today's lecture is going to be over chapter 29, section 2, Objectives. Examine how East Asian economies have grown by opening markets to the West. Number 2, identify the key economic powers in East Asia as well as the problems that they face. So today's lectures, we're going to kind of piggyback on something that we had talked about before. Uh, East Asian nations are isolated from the world until about uh, the 1500s. What we see is, is that the Europeans are going to use uh, various means including force to end the isolation. What had happened during this period of time was was that um, a lot of the European countries are trying to get to um, the Orient, trying to get to East Asian countries because guys like Marco Polo in the 1200 have been raving about gold and spices and things like that, perfumes as well. And so what happens is, is that um, people had continued to try to get here but because of long distances, because of uh, the Asian company, uh, companies not really wanting to spread and continuing to uh, move outwards, what we see is, is that the Europeans are going to basically be trying to get to India um, again from about the 1200s all the way until these 1800s. In the 1800s, what we see is, is that treaties give Europeans spheres of influence in the East. They're going to be exclusive areas where specific nations control tr uh, trade. And and so what we see is that really the 1800s, we start to see that the, um, the Asian countries are going to start to look at uh, these Western nations and start to see that they can benefit some. Uh, again, some of this was by force, some of it was um, by the Europeans, or excuse me, by the um, Chinese cultures, Mongolia, um, wanting to go westward and wanting to kind of learn about the culture. You see Commodore Matthew Perry, he's going to sail to Japan in 1853. He forces um, these countries in Japan to open up tra uh, trade with the United States. U.S. warship intimidated Japan into opening up to the United States and to the West. And so what we see is, is that again, by forcing them to open up trade, what we're going to see is, is that these, these countries in the East Asia are going to start to trade with uh, the United States, European nations, and things like this. After World War II, nations industrialize. Um, again, World War II is... Uh, really the most significant event for uh, really centuries just because a lot of the nations had to become industrialized had to become very big in manufacturing because they of course had to feed and clothe the um, the soldiers and so what we see is is that um, there's a real push for this to happen again after World War II the east-west trade increases quite a bit you may have seen on some of your um, things that you buy something that says made in China made in Japan they're very common in the West because what we see is is that they can uh, produce these items much 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 cheaper and faster and we'll talk about that later on in the lecture but regional economies are going to merge global economies will start to develop what is a global economy? These are nations that are independent for goods and services. An example of a global economy would be the United States. Um, they are interdependent with different countries. So, for example, the United States trades a lot of different things, um, but they also need to get things. A good example of this is oil. We have such a demand in the United States for oil and petroleum that we have to bring it from outside countries. So the United States is going to continue to try and trade as much as they can. And Japan is a country that really kind of utilizes this. There are import resources, um, export manufactured goods worldwide, and what we see is that the East Asian nations use cheap labor to come manufacturing powers. They don't have at this time after World War II, they don't have minimum wage, and so what we see is that they pay them very, very small amounts, and then they're going to go ahead and they're going to export. It's called aggressive exports, uh, and Japan is one of the countries that is very, very, very common and use this, but again, Japan has a global economy. Now, zone of prosperity. Many Asian countries do very well in the 1980s and early 1990s. Um, this is a time when I was kind of growing up, and what we saw was was that people thought that Japan was going to continue on um, forever being a, a great empire because they were doing such a good job of trading. What we see is something develops called the Jakarta Triangle. This is going to be Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, and it's a, in the Pacific Rim that's a big-time prosperity. Again, these countries right now are 
really trying to send out as many goods as they possibly can. Cheap manufacturing. Um, a lot of times they're uh, bringing things in, and what they're trying to do is that they're trying to lower tariffs as much as possible. But by the mid 1990s, these economies are going to start to have trouble, and you start to see these powers that everybody thought would be so dominant start to kind of rescind a little bit. Economic problems are going to start to arise. The Asian economies run on efficiency, innovation, and cheap labor. But in 1995, the UNICEF or the United Nations Children Fund says that over 500,000 East Asian children are working in factories and they're begging on the streets. And so what we see is, is that there's a huge, huge, huge push. Um, and, and we saw this back in the 90s. We saw a big push by a lot of people saying that they cannot have these children working in these factories, these sweatshops. Um, I remember Michael Jordan got in, getting into a little bit of hot water because they found out that Nike was using some of these um, shops. Not so much in East Asia, this was more in Indonesia, but again, the child labor being much, much uh, lenient there, um, Nike took advantage of that and they kind of got into a little bit of trouble. What we see in the mid-90s as well is that you get banks and businesses start to get bankruptcy and um, it starts to panic the foreign investors. What we see is that a lot of people have had stocks in the Asian stock market and pretty soon they start to sell it. This is almost identical to the United States um, uh, when they start getting their stock market crash back in 1929. You start seeing a lot of bad things happen. But what we see as an effect of these Asian stocks plummeting is riots occur and the government is going to start to topple. When this happens, the United States is going to enter a recession. You've probably heard about a recession, but you may not know exactly what it is. A recession is an extended decline in business activity. Now the question is, What's the difference between a recession and a depression? Uh, you've heard about the Great Depression. You heard that maybe we're in a depression right now or possibly just coming out of it. So what's the difference between a recession and a depression? The most common answer is, is that a recession is not as bad as a depression. Depression can last for up to 10 years. Um, sometimes you see that the entire country is affected by it, whereas a recession may not affect everybody and it may not be as long. And so um, those are kind of the, the big differences, right? right there. Now, what effect does it have? It's got a global kind of a ripple effect when Japan goes into this uh, recession. Many of the world's economies are going to be interconnected. And you see that in the United States. They're connected with a lot of areas around the world. And when they are going to their recessions, it hurts the United States. Um, if you're interested at all in any of this, there's something that's called macroeconomics and microeconomics. Microeconomics usually has to deal with kind of the country and how they're um, trading and um, benefiting things like that but macroeconomics is going to be the study of how countries kind of are inter interdependent um, but what we see is, is that the Asian economic crisis spreads throughout the world it's going to cause problems in the New York Stock Exchange which um, is going to lead to a lot of problems in the other exchanges as well now steps are going to be taken to prevent global economic downturn what we see is, is that the World Bank International Monetary Fund steps in they're going to lend money to East Asian companies and that they're going to promise is to basically get this reform and again the reform is trying to get the um, countries to not allow them to have these um, children working uh, the economic downturn does begin to reverse and they start seeing a little bit um, uh, improvement now the next thing here that we see is that we see is a promise of a reform crisis shows that East Asia is in East Asia is in a serious need for reform. So what they do is that they increase wages for adult workers. They also ban the child labor, um, forced labor practices that we saw. The, probably the thing that's the most famous though during this time is that they're going to require an end to sweatshops. And this is where you start seeing, you know, hundreds of people all crammed into a very small area, working from eight in the morning till eight at night, working for real, real, real low wages. Um, poor conditions, they're working for pennies a day. These sweatshops essentially make it so that um, these East Asia companies, people stop buying from them and when you start seeing this recession, they just try to go ahead and they start to get a reform. And these reforms are going to make it so that the Dakota Triangle kind of rebounds and starts trading. And uh, you see right now in the United States, we are connected with Japan and the rest of the countries and basically we're trying to make it so that um, if we're buying things from these countries, we're buying them from countries that have been the sweatshops and then the um, poor practice of having these people making little money working in sweatshops.
very short lecture today. This is going to be the end of the lecture. Again, this was chapter 29, section 2, Trade and Prosperity, how the Eastern, country, Eastern Asia countries are essentially going to open their doors to the United States and the rest of the world.